Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in the series of webinars organised by the Malta Business Network. This is the fifth one, I think, that we've done in the uh, I'm in the period since lockdown, and um, um, and they seem to be working well. Today's session deals with money value, and we have an expert panel to to help us arrive at a clearer picture of where we are in this matter. I'm really pleased to welcome Kenneth Faruja who is the director of the FIAU, um, Christopher Buttigieg, who is meant to be on, but is not on yet, and, uh, and, um, but he's joining us soon, I'm told, who's the chief officer supervision of the MFSA, Wayne Pisani, who's the president of the IFSP, Institute of Financial Services and Practitioners, and Fabio, uh, Fabio Axisa, president of the Malta Institute of Accountants, and obviously one of my former business partners, the, the, nowadays, we need to add in the word business before partners, so people don't get the wrong idea. Um, um, we've um, got a lot of participants today, over 200, I'm told. And, um, and as usual, if anybody wants to put any questions to the panel, please use the, use the feature on Zoom, which allows you to write down your query, and I'll, deal, and, and I'll do my best to try and deal with it during the course of our discussion. There is a, Q and A um, button at the at the top of your screen, and you should use that. Okay, let's let's dive dive straight in. Um, 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 and I'm going to start with you, Kenneth, if I may. Um, um, and for the benefit of those listening to us, can you give us a brief explanation of what money value is and why it is so important for Malta to get a positive evaluation, or at least not to be put on the infamous grey list? You're on mute, I think. So, okay. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, um, thanks, uh, Mr. Valencia. Thanks to Mr. Joza Mitabon and, and the Malta Business Net Network for this, for your kind invitation, and also for, and also to to all participants taking part in this event. Um, as you know, we have heard a lot about Manival. Um, uh, Manival is 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 an assessment. Um, uh, which is carried out on 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 the jurisdictions. Um, uh, as FIU, the Manival is, is not uh, an assessment on the FIU per se, but it's an evaluation of the country, um, and it deals with various um, uh, components that make up um, the control system for um, anti-money laundering and countering of financing of terrorism. So uh, it's an assessment, not solely for the FIU, but it's all of the police, of the law courts, um, of the supervisors, of the F MFSA, MGA, um, and other, other authorities such, such as the Asset Recovery Bureau and, and others. Um, uh, so the, the manual process um, uh, we, have been, uh, we have been through um, was uh, very, um, uh, intensive. Um, we have provided the Manival um, assessors with a lot of information, um, being both um, documentation in terms of policies, procedures, regulations, legislation, etc. Um, and it took a number of months. Um, um, one of one of the participants here is Dr. Alex Manjon, who who is also um, uh, an, an officer at the FIU head. Um, head of section who, who practically dealt with, with this process and uh, we have provided as a jurisdiction enormous amounts of data, even um, sanitized cases, etc. And uh, there's a pool of assessors which, which, uh, who are selected from different jurisdictions who are experts in the fields in different areas and uh, practically these experts um, uh, start to assess um, the information being provided by the jurisdiction and it takes quite um, uh, a number of months to assess all the information coming back for further um, clarifications and then the assessors come over um, for a period of, of two weeks um, here on site and uh, the assessors um, review and uh, hold intensive um, interviews with, with all stakeholders, not only authorities um, uh, involved in the, in, the fight, in the fight against financial crime, but also um, with the respective um, representative from the respective sectors, 
Um, they hold interviews. They um, they had come over also to the FIU. Um, we showed them our systems. They went through our uh, policies, cases, you know, and you discuss a lot of matters. Um, and then um, after the on-site examination, um, uh, a report, a first draft of a report is, is drafted. Um, uh, we, we had also face-to-face -face meetings to, to explain and to elaborate further on, 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 on the findings um, and also to provide additional information and clarification. Um, in fact, we visited um, uh, Manival at the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, um, uh, whereby we had three days, three full days of, of exchange of, of information once again. The report of, of Manival is also reviewed by, um, uh, by other parties, being um, uh, um, like the European Commission, etc., who provide feedback. So it's, it's a detailed review of all the controls in place um, at, at a national level. Um, uh, one, uh, one particular difference that this Manival review had was the assessment of um, effectiveness. So uh, previously, Manival, um, uh, when, when they conducted their reviews, they only assessed um, technical, technical compliance. So they uh, evaluated whether uh, a particular jurisdiction um, had implemented the international standards into, into, into legislation. However, this time around, um, uh, FATF um, uh, and Manival being one of the, uh, one of the bodies um, uh, assessing our jurisdiction, um, went also into assessing the effectiveness, that is, how we <coughs> are implementing um, the respective regulations and legislation we have in place. Um, so practically now, um, once the report is issued, um, as you know, we had 40 technical, um, uh, technical recommendations, whereby we um, had only nine uh, technical recommendations which were not, which were partially met, uh, and 31 where we were either compliant or largely compliant. So now we are remediating on nine recommendations under the technical compliance part. Whilst on the other hand, with regards to the immediate outcomes, uh, outcomes the effectiveness part, um, from 11 immediate outcomes, um, we failed practically on nine, and uh, we uh, obtained a pass mark on, on two of them. Um, the two that we achieved uh, a substantial rating were uh, international cooperation and uh, financial sanctions under IO, IO 11. So that's, in a nutshell, practically um, the whole process until, until the report, the report is, is finalized and published. So where we are now? We are now at um, an yeah, observation. I can interrupt Sorry. you. Sorry. I, I, I can just interrupt you for, for, uh, for somebody ignorant like me. Um, um, okay. um, what, is, what is a money value? Is it, um, 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 is it a body that falls under, under, under FATF? Or is, it a, or is it a Council of Europe body? What is it? No, so um, uh, Manival falls under the Council of Europe, but it's one of the um, regional style bodies who, who are conducting reviews on a number of jurisdictions. So practically, there's FATF as a governing body, but then there are regional bodies around, around the globe, and one of them is Manival. And Manival, we fall under the Manival, um, uh, uh, under the Manival uh, supervisory jurisdiction. It's, it's, it's the same standard, so FATF sets the standards and their the regional bodies um, uh, conduct these reviews to assess against those standards. If, it, if, it, if it's a Council of Europe body though, how come the US has uh, so much influence on it? So the, the, the US um, is one of the, um, not only the US, but it's, it's own, also other jurisdictions such as the UK, France, etc. Um, uh, who, who form part um, and fall under FATF. Um, uh, practically now, because this is very important, um, because we always speak about Manival. Um, Manival is going to assess uh, Malta for the technical recommendations. So with regards 
um, to the legislative um, amendments and the legislative framework that we have. Whilst on the other hand, it's, it's going to be the FATF that is going to assess Malta on, on the effectiveness part. So uh, FATF will determine whether Malta made enough progress or otherwise in terms of effectiveness in these uh, in, in, in this period of, of, of observation. Okay, and you, that's where the U.S. influence really, really comes in then? Yes, um, however, um, since the U.S. and other jurisdictions um, uh, form part of, uh, of FATF, there are, uh, um, uh, there are a number of, of, of jurisdictions, of countries, who are observers in the process of Manival, and they also um, uh, do comment on, on the review being carried out. So practically, whilst the assessors coming on site um, drafted the report, other bodies such as the IMF, such as um, uh, the European Commission, um, and a number of jurisdictions, one of them being the United States, and other jurisdictions had, um, had also contributed to the report by challenging the assessors in their, in their assessment. And, yeah. and this, is, this is something which is done on, on every jurisdiction. So it's not something which, which was done only on Malta. It's, it's the manoeuvre process. So FATF ensures that, that the regional style bodies are conducting their review in line with, their, with the FATF methodology um, effectively. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and when, uh, when, when, when is the final, final evaluation meant to, be, meant to be concluded by? Okay. So, uh, with regards to the technical compliance part, um, uh, now we have the deadline, the deadline for the technical compliance. We need to report to Manival, as, as I have highlighted. It's 5th October 2020, so it's a month in a month's time. Um, but that's with regards to the nine um, technical recommendations which, which we um, had uh, received an assessment of, of, non, uh, of partial compliance. So practically, um, we have nine recommendations whereby legislative changes had to be implemented. Um, five of them had to deal either direct, directly or indirectly with the FIU. Um, from our end, we have implemented all those changes. And uh, practically, we're going to report to Manival on the technical, on the technical recommendation site. So 5th October is the date deadline for reporting. Then in the December 2020 plenary, um, a decision will be taken by Manival whether Malta has, has effectively implemented those, those um, recommendations. With regards to the effectiveness um, part, um, it's it falls under the remit of uh, directly under the FATF. Um, uh, FATF, so we, have, we had 11 IOs and nine of them were received. Um, uh, we, we, we did not manage to achieve uh, uh, a good assessment. So practically FATF will, will um, assess all the recommendations falling on under those nine, nine IOs. Um, our deadline for reporting, um, FATF issued a, a, a communication whereby due to COVID, um, it had postponed the assessment by four months. So our, our reporting to FATF was due in October 2020. So that has moved now to February 2021. Um, then um, we had a, a discussion with the review group was scheduled for December 2020. So that's now... Um, being postponed to April 2021, and the plenary that had to take place in February 2021 um, to take a final decision um, is being postponed um, roughly till June 2021. So by June, in June 2021, the FATF plenary will take the final decision on Malta um, on whether we have um, uh, improved and implemented, in, uh, improved in terms of effectiveness or otherwise, um, uh, in June 2021. So, so, so that's the date by which we'll know whether we're on the grey list or not. Yes. And uh, and uh, and um, um, two of them get get put on the grey list. I mean, uh, are, you, um, are you allowed to fail like two or three IOs, or, or must you pass in each one? No, we we, we need to pass. Um, we need to fulfil um, each and every recommendation. So practically, if you have a look um, uh, at the Manivar report. 
there are um, a number of recommendations. So there are a number of findings and uh, then there are a number of recommendations. So practically, um, the FATF assessors will take each and every recommendation under each IO and uh, as Malta as a jurisdiction, we need to show that we uh, manage to, um, uh, to, to improve our effectiveness on, on, on that recommendation and implement the necessary um, uh, changes and controls. So practically, each and every recommendation will be assessed by the Monovar assessors, sorry, by the FATF assessors, and then if a number of recommendations have, have uh, not been fulfilled, um, even five, six of those recommendations has not, have not been fulfilled, we will be placed uh, on the grey list um, in order, um, so together with the FATF, we will address those six um, recommendations, for example. Um, okay. But I do hope that we will manage to fulfill all, all, the, all the recommendations. We all do, we all do, I'm sure. Um, 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 between, between now and, uh, I mean, when, when they make their assessment, it must be based on a picture at a point in time, right? When is, yes. when is that point? Is it December? Is it April? When is it? No, so the Manifar report took a snapshot of November 2018. Because um, uh, once the on-site examination is, uh, is, is carried out, then a jurisdiction, that's the final point whereby we can submit further documentation, case studies, etc. cetera. Um, so practically the snapshot was November 2018. So now we need to take stock of all, um, of all the actions that the, the juris our jurisdiction managed to implement from November 2018 to date, to, till February 2021, to show that the recommendations have actually been, been implemented. And, 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 and therefore, can we expect more actions from the, from the regulatory authorities between now and February 2020, Alura? From our end, yes. Um, if, we, if we take the case of the FIU, um, we're, still not, we're still not there. So we, we have a number of actions in the pipeline which are being currently implemented. You know, due to COVID, et cetera, we, we had yeah. some delays. Um, uh, we had a plan. Um, uh, I can speak also at a national level. So the National Coordinating Committee within the Ministry of Finance, um, uh, together with all stakeholders, we have drafted an, an action plan which is quite detailed um, ad to address each and every recommendation. Um, that, that action plan is being monitored by the National Coordinating Committee. We are reporting to the National Co Coordinating Committee um, on, on a monthly basis, providing feedback, providing the actions that we have implemented. Um, from our end, I can speak on behalf of the FIU because we're taking care of, of our action plan. We have implemented um, the majority of, 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 of the recommendations. Um, however, in terms of effectiveness, um, I, I, I need to highlight to show effectiveness, is not just implementing particular actions, but you need to also to show results. So in terms of supervisory activity, it's, it's, it's useless to improve and to um, change your policies, procedures, etc. But you need to show um, how many examinations um, the authority has, has carried out. And uh, from a statistical point of view, you need to, um, to show that we have improved from previous years. So for example, even 2018, we have carried out solely um, 58 examinations. Um, uh, we need to show an improvement. For example, in case of the FIU, from an um, from a supervisory perspective, in 2019 and 20, because our supervisory year is um, July to June, we managed to conduct 170 um, supervisory examinations. Um, and hopefully we can show um, an improvement there, even in terms of enforcement, in terms of um, uh, analyst, an, an analytical reports being sent to the police, even in terms of, of timing, um, uh, when we are conducting the analysis. So um, uh, you need to show with statistics, with, with um, case studies, that um, the recommendation has been fulfilled. So, 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 so based on what you're saying, is, is this an assessment on the effectiveness of the regulatory bodies, or is it an assessment of the, of the, of the practitioners who you regulate? Because, because, because let me just bring in, bring in a couple of 
question. Sorry, Ken, it at this. Hello, um, Kevin at this money. Hi, hi, Chris. All right, okay, I'm on the line, man. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, Chris, Chris has just joined us, and Kenneth, so, 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 okay. so, so, so at least you've got, got somebody on your side now. Um, oh, no problem. Um, let me, I let can me, deal with it. I'm sure you could. Let me just bring in a couple of questions which, 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 um, which uh, the participants have sent, which fit in. First of all, somebody has asked, what rating should we get? Is substantial enough? So, um, uh, we, we need to, to obtain at least um, uh, uh, a substantial rating. So, uh, um, either low or moderate is not enough. Um, we had some 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 uh, moderate, we had some low, for example, under RO3, which, which is the AML CF to supervision, which falls under the FIU um, uh, remit, we, we achieved a low, a low rating. So we need to, um, uh, to achieve at least a substantial, a substantial rating. Okay. Then, uh, um, one but more. it's not, it's, it, sorry, uh, it's not only um, on, uh, so, under IO4, there's also the input of, 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 of uh, the subject persons of the sectors. Um, under IO3, it's supervisory, but then there are the, 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 the IO6, 7, and 8, which, which we need to, so, to show um, significant improvement in terms of effectiveness under um, the Malta police, under the law courts, under the Asset Recovery Bureau. So uh, it's, 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 it's all over, the, the whole, all stakeholders need to show improvement in terms of effectiveness. Well, okay, which leads on nicely to, to another question sent in. And this one says, the FIAU has carried out several compliance visits, as, um, as you said, Kenneth, during, uh, during uh, 1920, and the time taken to, to issue your reports has improved considerably. However, when such reports indicate potential breaches, Will this be enough to, to show effectiveness, or do we need to go through the rest of the process whereby sanctions, if any, are communicated and, and then go through the appeals process? So, um, uh, no, we need, we need to, to, um, uh, to show effectiveness also on the enforcement side, but the enforcement side does not equate to, to penalties. So, uh, um, uh, from an FIO perspective, um, we have reduced the, the timing for issuing the reports, and that was one of the main um, problems we were encountering in the past, because we were carrying out, for example, we had a backlog of reports coming, deriving from 2014, for example, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we managed to deal with that backlog in 17 and 18, and we have started afresh now from 2018 um, onwards. Um, uh, so, with regards to examinations, yes, we have reduced the timing. In terms of enforcement actions, um, we, we need to also to show, to show effectiveness. Now, um, the timing to, to take enforcement action, um, it's, it, it, it's quite um, complex. However, we're trying also to reduce timing um, and to be more efficient in, in that regard too. Um, however, the, we're, we're meeting, for example, the Compliance Monitoring Committee is meeting on a weekly basis rather than on a monthly basis. Um, uh, we are also, um, uh, we are also um, taking action not solely by issuing um, pecuniary fines, but we are also, for example, issuing directives, um, taking, um, following uh, on, on, on remedial actions. So there's an array of of, of, of actions which are being taken by the FIU, which can be reported also to, um, to, uh, to FATF. Okay. Let me, uh, but, but, but also, um, sorry, um, just a small point. In uh, terms of, of figures, if we take um, our annual report, for example, in terms of sanctions, um, if we compare figures with previous years, last year in 2019, and we had the four million, um, uh, four million of sanctions were issued by the FIO. Um, so if we compare 2018 with 2019 with 2018, the amounts um, were were smaller. Um, uh, I, I think the the amounts amounted to 800,000. I think in 2000 and 
in 2018. So there's 996,000. So there was a considerable um, increase also in the enforcement actions taken by the FIO. But um, yeah, 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 yeah. I would argue with you as to whether that's a fair measure or not. But but I'm not going to do that now. Okay, for okay. Me. Please, I'm going to give you a short break and bring in Chris because Chris, Chris, I understand had a bit of a problem joining us joining us from, from his computer, despite the millions invested by the MFSA. And he's using, um, um, and he's using his phone. Oh, it's Chris. Um, yes, uh, yes, Kevin, are you hearing me? Yes, yes, we are. Um, 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 can I ask you, Chris, this? Do you agree that, at least amongst the stakeholders in the financial services industry, there's been a loss of confidence in the willingness or the ability of the regulators and government institutions to carry out their role without fear or favour. Um, 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 what, what steps are you going to take, if any, to ensure this loss of confidence is remedied? What, what I mean by this is, sometimes there's a feeling out in the marketplace that the regulators um, um, are strong with the weak and weak with the strong. Um, 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 first of all, do you accept that that's the case? And, and if so, how are you going to remedy this loss of confidence? I think I think as a, I've been, I mean, Kevin, as you know, I've been working in financial supervision for the past 20 years. And um, throughout my career, I've always seen MFSA as a regulator which takes action. Um, uh, the issue is not whether we took action or not. The issue is how fast we were to take action and uh, uh, sort of... Uh, the amount of, of uh, visits we carried out and the efficiency uh, with respect to which um, we, we managed to authorize firms. So the main criticisms on the MFSA, we want to focus on MFSA, which is the institution I represent, um, is not, the main criticism is not whether MFSA was taking action or not. Um, it's how fast it took action and whether the action was sufficient or not in the circumstances. Um, I think we've had a number of uh, cases where we've learned from the experience of those cases. And we've took action to enhance um, our policies, our procedures, and also our institutional um, framework to make us more efficient. Um, I mean, mentioning Pilatus, Sata, I mean, we've learned from, from uh, these, these uh, cases and like other regulators, and MFSA is one regulator out of many in Europe that is responsible for financial supervision, that has had um, these issues to deal with, uh, we've learned from, from these experiences. Uh, and we've taken a number of steps to address the issue of um, efficiency and effectiveness, which is something that we will be assessed by, by Moneyval. We've already been assessed in the past and will be assessed again. Uh, we've done an, an, an overhaul of, of the MFSA, as you're aware. Um, we've changed our uh, organizational structure and our operating model. Uh, we've introduced new functions to take on um, certain aspects of our supervision, like the financial crime compliance function, um, which is now made up of um, 18 officials and it will increase to 20 officials by the end of the year that are responsible specifically to carry out on-site inspections um, as requested by the FIEU in the field of um, anti-money laundering and, and uh, financing of terrorism. And uh, it, it, by the end of this cycle of uh, of uh, visits in the field of AMS, CFT, as requested by FIU, we would have carried out um, 75 visits on our licensed entities. Uh, we've established a due diligence function, which specifically carries out not only due diligence at authorization stage, but also on an ongoing basis. Um, we've established an enforcement directorate with an enforcement unit, um, which again is, is manned by 12 people and they are uh, focusing uh, only on enforcement in order to strengthen our, our enforcement action. 
and uh, if you monitor what we've been uh, issuing recently and what has also been announced in the media, uh, MFSA is quite active in enforcement at the moment, which is, it, it, it's not, a, in my view, it's not a, a measure of effectiveness because ultimately a measure of effectiveness is more um, the, 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 the entities which we manage to keep out of the system and which would like to access the system and which are, are not acceptable. However, um, the, the cleanup needs to be done and, and we're doing it. Uh, yeah. And we're also, as I mentioned before, at authorization stage, going into more detail um, with respect to due diligence to ensure that, that bad actors don't access our system. We're also being um, very, very uh, forthcoming with respect to providing guidance to the industry of what is acceptable or not uh, immediately on day one before, before the, the applicant actually makes the application. And this is one of the action points that um, uh, we are, we are uh, working on and uh, which we're focusing on in order to avoid uh, situations where applicants apply for a license uh, and then eventually after a number of months they're told that they're not acceptable. So trying to keep out the, the bad apples before they actually apply through the process of pre-application pre -application meetings. Um, we have also increased our, our number of on-site inspections, not only with respect to what um, the, uh, the FIU requests us to do, but also our prudential visits. And overall, um, uh, in 2020, uh, we, we are going to carry out, by the end of the year, um, 350 on-site inspections, which is quite a substantial increase when you see the figures for 2018. I mean, in 2018, we carried out 168 visits. By the end of this year, we, we would have carried out 350, notwithstanding COVID um, and notwithstanding uh, the challenges brought by, by COVID. Um, we're also uh, working on um, uh, increasing staff. And uh, as, as I'm sure you're aware, we're growing to 450 by the end of this year. Um, I mentioned already that, that um, uh, the, the FCC team, which, which is going to be a 20-man team by the end of this year as well. And we're also working on strengthening knowledge of our staff. I mean, recruiting uh, approximately 150 staff in, in, in two years is, is no joke. And therefore, we decided to establish um, our academy for supervisors, which focuses on training financial supervisors. And uh, there's a significant focus on AML, CFT uh, training for our staff through, through this, this academy. So not only increasing staff, but also focusing on knowledge and depth of staff. Um, that's, I think, I think, in a nutshell, um, what we've been doing. We're focusing more, again, um, and I think I, I should mention this on the risk-based approach, and this is very important. It's, it's, uh, no regulator in the world has sufficient resources to dedicate the same amount of uh, supervisory engagement with respect to every type of entity. So we're refining our risk-based approach metrics and uh, We've already refined them earlier on this year to include the AML CFD element, but we continue refining them um, to, to ensure that we have a horizontal approach for every firm and that by the end of every year, we've got one um, system which classifies um, every licensed entity into high, medium or low. And that, that should guide even further our, our level of supervisory engagement uh, with the industry. Uh, yeah. One final point, and uh, you seem quite eager that I close off my <laughs> my intervention. So, I'll, no, I'll no, do the no, Chris, but uh, but uh, but I've got a lot of questions coming in, and I would want to ask one or two, one or two. So, so as soon as you yes, definitely. So one one just one final point, and I think this is important. Um, one of the things that I I've pushed for um, since becoming chief supervision is that we integrate AML-CFT assessment in our prudential work. 
So uh, the prudential supervisor, um, one of the, 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 the uh, assessment of risks for every entity uh, will be AML CFT. And that um, should strengthen even further our assessment of AML CFT um, of our industry. Now, to close off, we're not doing this for Manival. Um, we're doing this because we want to strengthen uh, Malta as a jurisdiction of choice for serious players. So ultimately, that is the goal. That is the strategy. Um, with this, in, in terms of supervision, we will pass the Manival test. However, um, this is part of a long-term strategy. And the long-term strategy is to um, strengthen more, more the, the, the uh, strength, actually strengthen the position of Malta as a jurisdiction of choice for serious players. Yeah. Okay. Chris, so let me just, just say, say that I think that from a licensed entity point of view, I, I, I think that the regulatory framework is, is um, strong, it exists, it works, etc. But, but, but I'm sure Kenneth and you and, and Fabio and Wayne must agree that, that there's a whole raft of other business activity being carried out in Malta, which where there are some strange transactions going on, which are not licensed or regulated, for example, property development. Do we, who, who would you cover that? How, does, how do we ensure that any, that, that, that any evidence or allegations of money laundering are, um, um, are dealt with there? Who, who would deal with that? Kenneth, perhaps you would, perhaps you'd like to get that. So, um, uh, we, we, we are covering um, uh, real, real estate agents, so uh, as part of our supervisory um, efforts. Um, as Chris highlighted, um, we have some 2,200 subject persons here in Malta. Um, um, some of them are including the real estate agents, so we do risk assess our sectors um, and our players. Um, we have introduced the CASPAR system, which, which practically takes a lot of information, um, being information being provided by the subject persons themselves. We take also into consideration information from prudential um, supervisors. Um, um, we take into consideration any intelligence, etc. So practically we risk assess the sector and uh, we are performing a number of supervisory activities. I don't think um, that uh, we, 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 we are also um, engaging through training and outreach and we have issued a particular guidance note for um, uh, real estate and, uh, and also for notaries to help them um, uh, in, in this area. Um, uh, so, so practically, yes, we, we are covering property development by, by covering um, real estate and notaries um, uh, in in uh, in uh, in, uh, in our supervisory efforts. Um, All right. Wait. And wait. They have, and wait. They have you, I'm going to bring sorry. you in now. Hmm. Okay. Let, let me just ask. Wait. Now you 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 um, first. 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 Because I know that, uh, that that amongst your members you've got a lot of lot of financial services and practitioners and um, and it seems to me in an uh, um, in an attempt. To ensure that Malta gets a pass mark in this um, in this money val evaluation of the past couple of years, there's been a raft of new rules and uh, regulations designed to demonstrate that uh, that uh, the practitioners are subjected to a more rigid compliance framework. Do you think that this reaction is proportionate and fair? And of Fabio, after Wayne answers, uh, I'm going to ask you the same thing, so so you can prepare your answer. Wayne, well. Um, reactions are never wise, so allow me to, 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 to um, re-articulate. Re I mean, whether it's fair and proportionate, um, uh, well, obviously, uh, once you hit the panic button, then obviously uh, you start reacting. And uh, Monivel, uh, I think it was uh, a perfect storm as what, what we experienced here. Having said that, I think the biggest pain point is the fact that we're looking at Monivel as the end, whilst it's actually the first step in the journey, because if we, our focus is just on Monivel and just ticking the boxes to pass the test, then we are going to fail the economy. And that's, that's our concern as practitioners, ultimately. 
uh, practitioners have been raising the bar since the various iterations of the uh, anti-malandering directives. Um, and, and we're now discussing the sixth. And it's constantly a question of raising the bar. But as Kenneth pointed out, I think the, uh, the reaction which we're facing today compared to the past uh, evaluation reports, let's bear in mind that this is the fifth Moneyval evaluation report of Malta, is the fact that this time we were assessed on our effectiveness. And when I say our, I mean the country as a whole. And I don't believe there should be an us and them mentality that uh, we are doing our part and the others are not and so forth. It's a matter, we're in the boat together. Um, we've been building our uh, industry and reputation for decades uh, now. And we need to make sure that, obviously we need to pass the test. If we fail the test, um, there will have been questions as to gray listing and so forth. Um, ultimately, should God forbid we get grey listed, our plan should be to get out of the grey list soon as possible. So, um, uh, whether the delays that uh, were driven by by the current pandemic were played in our favour or against, um, that's a matter of opinion. But what's certain, and uh, here I get to your question, is that the reaction that we've seen by the various um, uh, authorities or, or, or competent uh, bodies um, uh, proposing and getting regulations through parliament um, through siloed approaches are actually um, hurting the industry and there should be a more coordinated approach as to how we regulate and obviously show that we are effective, that the, we demonstrate that the regulations are actually being implemented. I mean, traditionally and historically, we have been extremely good at churning out regulation, and that's how we attracted business to the island through being innovative, uh, innovative through regulation. But now we risk that through the regulations that we are um, putting through Parliament or we have been putting through Parliament over the past months, we're also risking killing the industry as well because certain um, regulations are not proportionate. And I do not just mean that the articulation of the regulations are not proportionate, but the way that they are being implemented by the resources that are being employed by the different bodies, be it um, uh, FIAU, MBR, MFSA, which is ultimately the same problem that we're facing us as industry, that we are lacking the quality resources who are capable to think and critically evaluate what they need to do. And that when presented with a regulation, they apply it to the letter and normally they go overboard. So it's more the application of that regulation which is becoming worrying. Obviously, as an institute, we are making representations before these actually start being drafted. So as there was this, the, the uh, if you allow me, I'm going to call it infamous CSP framework here. I mean, we started discussing this two years ago, and, and you may recall, Kevin, uh, when we started the whole debate. I mean, fast forward today, um, we're three, four months away from being um, tested as to whether we have ticked that box on the terms of regulating CSPs. But the conversation that is going, we have submitted multiple recommendations, but we still do not know exactly how, what that will look like. So. Fabio, do you want to give your, give your views here? Uh, to change my answer now, because Wayne um, uh, took all my, I think we have, we've exchanged notes. He took my replies and I took his. Yeah. Uh, but but um, I think it, it, the reaction was very tough, um, um, unfair to a number of players in my profession, but frankly required. So uh, this is uh, the message that we are trying to um, uh, trying to support as an institute. Um, the, uh, the operating framework, our operating framework, our regulatory framework has changed. It's tougher, it's stricter. And the supervisory framework is stricter and tougher. Um, so for example, Kenneth was referring to the number of inspections that are being carried out. They're more intrusive. They focus on specific areas. They focus on the difficult areas, on the subjective areas, the quality of the findings is what it is. The expectations on remediation are what they are. So the supervisory um, um, effort in, is, is, is more clinical and that obviously um, has its consequences, uh, brings its consequences. Um, going back to the, to the framework, and when I said the tighter framework, 
we have to, I think as a profession, and I think as a market in general, we have to understand that the world around us has changed. So uh, the, the way business is executed has changed. And most of the requirements when we say, okay, we're inundated and there's been um, too, many too many new requirements, most of these requirements are emanating from international requirements. So international expectations, correspondent banks' expectations, um, a bit our performance, because we did have polluters in the market, so our performance in that area would have attracted more uh, tighter requirements. If you ask me, do, do, we, do you agree as institutes that an accountant, a professional accountant, should have two regulators, the accountancy board and the MFSA, because a particular accountant does CSP work? My answer is clearly no, it's not, it's not the right answer. Do you support it as institute? I tell you, if we are trying to, and CSP was, CSP work was one of the, was deemed to be one of the polluters in, in this area. Are we trying to regulate an entire sector, clean it, and remove perhaps a minimal amount of polluters, and we, therefore we need a sector-wide solution? I tell you, I would support it, I would welcome it, although I don't necessarily agree with it, because it will uh, strengthen the sector, strengthen the profession per se, albeit create, create um, more compliance costs and the, and, the and the difficult operating infrastructure. If I may, Kevin, just a bit of a, I just said that the world around us has changed and I think this is one of, one of the key issues. Um, our business model, as you know, has been very successful. We have built a tremendous um, uh, marketplace in terms of energy services, but not just over, um, over a number of years. And our success, uh, our in success, especially in the earlier years, and I'm sure you will recall this really well, was lying, was being low key, focusing on quality, focusing on substance, and attracting the best players. And that was instrumental. I think at some point in time, the quality model became a quantity business model, and that, frankly, from a jurisdiction like ours, is, is for, for a jurisdiction like ours, probably is not, a, is not a great model. We need to change that model. We need to be selective in terms of sectors, in terms of names, in terms of type of business we want. But we have to take cognizance of the way that the world around us has changed. Compliance expectations, risk management expectations have changed. And we can say, oh, we're the best profession, we're the best uh, jurisdiction, so on and so forth. Unfortunately, the world around us has changed. So, so I go back to my original uh, one-liner, very tough, very tough reaction, a lot going on. I think unfair to most of the players who have done a lot of good work in this jurisdiction and who continue to do good work, notwithstanding the pollution, but unfortunately it's required. So I, this is the message we give our members. Guys, we understand, but we have to move on. We have to raise the bar, we have to in, in enhance quality, we have to go for better names, we have to pay attention to what work we expect to do, so on and so forth. So, but this leads, Fabio, but this leads, leads, and this I'm throwing open to, to everyone, but I'd like you to begin, Fabio. This leads to, to, to a bit of a, bit of a conundrum. So, so, so there's an argument that the ease of doing business in Malta has deteriorated to such an extent that even if we do pass the money val evaluation, it is going to be far less attractive for inward investment than in the past. What, how are we going to reconcile asylum, economic drivers with the need to ensure proper standards. So that I know um, because, because as Chris mentioned earlier, we want to attract different people. Can, can um, I think, um, Ke Kevin, Kevin can, I, can I intervene? I think we need a strategy. Kevin, we Kevin, need, I um, thought we, it, can't, it's, it's, we can't have a session around by regulators, yeah? We need equal time. You want to become director of supervision at the MFSA and then you get equal time. Until then, no. I know, I know, I look at it. Mala, um, you know, I believe that Malta needs a, a clear strategy for financial services. I think we can't do everything. We need to focus. And we need to start thinking for post-Manival, post-COVID scenario. Where, what are we going to focus on? Um, how are we going to generate more growth? And what efficiencies do we need to introduce, not only with respect to the application for, for a license at MFSA, but the, the whole area, efficiencies with respect to tax, efficiencies with respect to um, uh, getting, getting the, the 
the relevant permits for foreigners to work on the island. So a clear strategy. Um, what are we going to be focusing on? What are, we what are the sectors we're going to fo be focusing on? How are we going to achieve growth? I think um, we, should, we should avoid taking um, the approach of, of saying, listen, Malta has become too heavy, too bureaucratic, nobody's going to come here. I think we should take a positive, positive attitude of saying, listen, at the moment we're focusing primarily on Manival. This is important. We need to pass this test. Post Manival, we need to sit down. We need to um, strategize and say, listen, which are the sectors in financial services um, where there is potential for Malta to grow? And focus on those sectors. And, and um, try to ensure that the sectors we select where we're going to focus for, for growth um, we try to avoid areas where they can, again, put us into, into trouble with these international institutions. Or at least if we decide that we're going to select those areas, we prepare ourselves from now on preparing frameworks that can mitigate the risks. And not only preparing frameworks, but also preparing our staff and preparing the jurisdiction for those, for those risks. In, in order to avoid um, situations that, like those that we've experienced so far. So I think yeah. we, need, we need to have a clear strategy. As but, Yeah, know, well, can I, uh, can I interrupt you, Chris? I mean, one of my problems, though, with this answer is that, that when I cast my mind back over a number of years when I was still practicing, say back to 94, two things. One, I don't think any of the factors which used to attract in good, reputable in international business to Malta are still, um, um, still exist. That's one. And the second thing is that, uh, that, uh, that at the very beginning, we always had a very low-key task force working on the next thing, working on how we were going to make Malta, Malta attractive for good business. As, as far as I know, that, 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 that stopped because it's obviously been derailed by a lot of things which, which have happened since then. So, so what I'm saying is definitely that it should take place. My argument is I believe that it should have been taking place for a long time um, 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 because it's good. until we catch up again, it's going to take us, take us quite a bit of effort and time. And, uh, and I think finding out what makes Malta attractive is, is going to be very difficult. I mean, if you look at our reputation, in my view, it is, it's, it's, been, it's, it's been totally impaired. Um, 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 if you look at our tax system, it's under, under attack and we've signed, signed a number of international treaties, meaning that, that our tax efficiency isn't going to be around for much longer in my mind. And there are a number of other things. So, Fabio, let me bring you back in because, because my role isn't to, to, to take part, but, but to ask you, um, for your thoughts on this, I mean, <clears throat> how are we going to going to attract inward investment in these in the, uh, um, in the current scenario? And then, and then I'll ask you, Wayne, Wayne as well for this. Um, Ke Kevin, this is it's going to be a long term. It's going to be a long term uh, trip. In fact, one of the key messages uh, used by a particular country, which was in our same situation and then avoided grey listing, was. The central bank governor, the minister for finance, the prime minister of that country used to say, it's beyond Manival, it's beyond FATF. We have a 10-year program, we have a 10-year uh, trip to cleanse the jurisdiction. I think what Chris referred to before, I think in both his interventions, Chris was saying, listen, we're going to go through a period of pain. We're going to have to cleanse, unfortunately, the jurisdiction from a number of players. Um, I'll, come, I'll zoom in on this point a bit, a bit, a bit uh, later. Um, uh, and then, um, over a number of years, when, when, you, when, the, when, when the, the world, the third parties, see that we're taking um, certain actions, um, we're, we're going back to the origins of our financial services, um, uh, our service, um, proposition, that we are policing, that, we, that certain players who used to target Malta because they thought it was easier, uh, to do business in Malta, arbitrage, uh, are no longer interested in Malta because uh, we, have, uh, we have cleansed the jurisdiction for a number of years. As you said, um, um, Kev, 
1994 and post that, our model was one based on quality, names, um, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, we went through a change, and there was a shift towards volume. When you have a, a volumes game, uh, there's a percentage of bad apples that will always join the game, unfortunately, whether you're the best jurisdiction or the worst one, that happened to us. Now, we're going through a process, and you see the supervisory efforts, and uh, not because they're here, but uh, I mean, I, I said this in, in, in other places as well, MFSA, FIU, uh, their supervisory efforts, and uh, you, you, all you need to do is read the papers, see the sanctions issued, which is not necessarily great, but um, the number of actions taken is such that over a number of years, a number of players who targeted MOTA for arbitrage purposes will, will leave, um, unfortunately, uh, but maybe it's not that unfortunate. And uh, we will have a jurisdiction characterized by a cleaner number of names, uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a lesser number of players, unfortunately, but maybe is that unfortunate. And then the, uh, the uh, better quality names will start looking at Malta again as the place, the place where they want to locate their business. It's not going to be an easy process. It's not going to be a short-term process, clearly. Um, there's going to be pain. In this but but you, if I may interrupt you, with Fabio, I think you are omitting a key question, which is, which, which, which is why should people look at Malta at all? Because, 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 as you know, our domestic market is very, very small, tiny. So, so, so foreign players don't come here for the local market. So, so, so they come here to use Malta as a base for international business. What, what I think that we need to answer, and Wayne, I'm going to bring you in now. Um, um, um. If I may, if I may address partially your question, I think in when I refer to selectivity before, we also have to be careful which sectors we want to target. We can't do everything, so we have to be um, uh, we have to be careful in what sectors we want to target. Target specific those sectors. I know there are a number of areas that are being targeted um, even now. I know that um, a number of a number of activities are ongoing to develop certain niches, and that that, that is the way forward. We can't do everything. It's going to be, we tell me, why Malta? We have to rediscover the why Malta of the 1994. Now, it will be a different world because it's 25, whatever years later. Um, so what was attractive in 94 will be, will, 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 it's not, it doesn't work now. Um, uh, clearly, there are still a number of areas, a number of products which we can develop, which we can, which we can make a, a name for ourselves in. And I know that there are a number of areas where, where we're developing these products and we're, we're, we're going to, we'll, but essentially, it's the wrong time to market Malta, however. So if you tell me, what are we doing to market Malta now? It's probably not the right time to market Malta. It's the right time to end and create a better... At, at, the moment, uh, at the moment, it's the right time to, to make a strategy. To exactly. think again. To think again what makes Malta attractive. And some of the things that made Malta attractive in 1994 might still make Malta attractive today. However, I agree. Circumstances have changed. Situation has changed. The environment has changed. So let's um, sit down, let's discuss, let's prepare a strategy. Unless we do so, unless we have a clear plan, we're planning to fail. And that's what I think um, we should be doing um, as one team. So industry together with the, with the government bureaucracy. And I'm saying bu government bureaucracy because I don't think it's only obtaining a license from MFSA that needs to become efficient. I think we need to become efficient in, in, in all the different departments and, and trying to create once again the idea of, of perhaps having a, a one-stop shop um, for, for foreigners that want to establish themselves here. I mean, that's, that's how other jurisdictions that are competitors of Malta operate. Um, when you look at Luxembourg and Ireland, that's how they work. They work together to try and find solutions to make their jurisdiction attractive as a jurisdiction of choice for serious players. But, but Chris, this is, a, and, and Wayne, I'd like you to come in here. This is, a, this is some, these are things which, which I totally agree with, but which we were saying, saying in 94, by the way, Fabio, I think you need to brush up on your maths. 94 is 26 years ago, okay, not 20. Um, 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 I said um, 25, 25, I said. No, no, anyway, it doesn't matter. Wayne, Wayne. Um, yeah, um, I mean, in fact, uh, I, I, I mean, let's start from, from the, in fact, I appreciate Chris's, to a certain extent, uh, change of stance here, because Chris said after Manevel originally, and now he said we need to work on a strategy. I believe that the strategy has to be worked I said, upon I said, in parallel.
I, no. That's my way. I said, I said we need to work for a strategy for after Moneyval. Okay. So uh, that's that's that's. You're what, exhausting what, your airtime, Chris. <laughs> Uh, yeah. No, but what I am, yeah. So, le, le, joking apart. No, I mean, I could, we've been, as you said, Kevin, we've been talking about a strategy, and we all agree that we need a strategy. So instead of talking about the need for a strategy, let's get down and do it. And we've been asking and, and discussing at sitting round tables that we need to address a budget ultimately to address this. But we, we have to stop short trying to short circuit this strategy in how to get there. And I believe we really need to look at what does Malta stand for? I think we really need to identify not how can we make Malta attractive or what is Malta attractive or what has been Malta. What does Malta stand for? And when we identify what does Malta stand for, that is the message that we need to start giving out there, especially for FDI purposes. Because if we go out at this current moment in time, the moment that we mention Malta, we, we are going to be, you know, either love that or else the first things that come to mind are obviously not our attractive or sunshine as it used to be. I mean, we used to pride ourselves to be bilingual. And I'm going to start from the very basics, which is far more than a 10-year strategy here. What has happened to our ability to be bilingual or at least being able to speak English properly. I mean, we, we are literally struggling with that very fundamental principle. So if we are going to be attractive for business, and it's not a matter of going with me, but as it was, now I'm going to say 30 years ago, you're going to correct me 32, um, if I call, recall right, or 31. But I mean, we went for the low-hanging fruit and changed tack within six years there. We cannot afford similar mistakes now. And as we know, I do not need to mention the infamous mistakes we've made over the past five years by going towards sectors which might have not, it might not have been the right time to go um, uh, in that direction. Having said that, we really need to, and I go back to what does Malta stand for? And with that message, then we start identifying which countries even to tap. We cannot afford to go with a trade mission to a country when we know that that is perceived as a high-risk jurisdiction, even by in order to bank business coming from that jurisdiction. It's a waste of resources, time, effort, and we're obviously trying to miss um, promote Malta because if we're going to claim to be open for business for a certain jurisdiction whereby banks, be it correspondent bankers or reputationally from an EU perspective, they are not countries that we should be even looking at. Then why are we going there with political contingents? Aren't we sending the wrong message when we are then going to bankers or institutional investors trying to tell them come and do business with Malta? Because the first thing they will do, they will not go to World Check and whatnot, they will go to Google. And when they will look up Malta, and the first thing that they will come up are the, 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 the obviously um, the sensationalism reporting that is hitting the island. So we really need to look at inward looking and ensuring that all the Maltese become ambassadors of the country. Because I believe that we're losing the pride and the patriotic element to be Maltese. And I use the word ambassadors on purpose here. The ambassadors and diplomatic missions that we, ha we have out there we need to rebuild bridges with our foreign counterparts because as things stand today, the bridges that we used to have are to a certain extent broken and we need to rebuild them. We need, we need to rebuild the respect that Malta um, uh, should garner in, in the international forum. So that is part of the strategy that we need to, to look at. Then, yes, we need to look at the how and which areas we should be tapping. And yes, we should stop spreading ourselves so thinly because from a resources perspective, be it human, economic, and, and, and so forth, we cannot afford to try and capture all kind of business. We really need to focus our resources. I mean, if it's a compliance function, we need to instill efficiency. We cannot have the job repeated by the practitioner by the MFSA, by, by the FIU, by the bank. We, we really need to get our house in order in terms of imbuing whatever technologies and uh, developments there are and making the processes really efficient. And again, I repeat, we were joking about the millions invested by the MFSA, but why aren't we 
joining ourselves at the hip. And if there's a con an investment which is being made by the country, then it's being made holistically rather than MFSA going its way, FIO going its way, MBR is going its way. Then you need to figure out how to get those systems to communicate. Then when we're going to report to Manivel or, or the, the review committee, we need to extract data or else even worse, go to the practitioners with multiple questionnaires asking the same questions, then getting the data, needing to crunch the data to make sure it's aligned because the questions are not aligned between the respective bodies, then ending up with conflicting data and obviously ending, risking ending up the laughing stock of the SSS. So we really need to, this, this in where looking, it's not a matter of regulations, it's the effectiveness of the way we are running the business, the show in Malta. Okay. Kevin, Kevin, if I may, uh, 20 seconds only on this thing of strategy. I mean, raising the bar, um, uh, enhancing quality and, uh, and raising quality standards is a strategy in itself. Because when you cleanse a, a, a jurisdiction from that point of view in five years' time, you're going to get the nice, sexy names again. So uh, that's, that's one point of view as well. You might not agree with that, but, but that is um, akin to a strategy. So if you raise quality, you expect that in X years' time, the attractiveness uh, to the bigger names is, is restored as well. I think we all agree that, 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 as Chris said, that we need to be working on the strategy. I think whether the main question, I, I, because for me, proper regulation and proper implementation of that regulation is a given. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, in my mind, there should be no compromise on that whatsoever. But I think we need to answer the question, why Malta? And, uh, um, um, and that, I think, is a bit more difficult. And, then, uh, the, um, and let me just uh, t tell, tell all the participants, I know that, the, that you're asking lots of questions. I can see, I think there are over 30 that we need to get through. I will, I'm, 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 I'm what I propose to do, to do at the end of this, I'll just run through them quickly and just, uh, just, just do a quick fire Q&A with, with, with our panelists, it's, because, because, because otherwise we are going to get a bit derailed. Kenneth, I'm going to bring you in now because, because you've been really quiet and, and um, hiding in the background there. Can I, um, if you look at the Moneyval report July 19, okay, as, um, and as you said earlier, it, it clearly stated that we have the legal framework necessary to, to combat money laundering, financial terrorism, but it was the implementation where we are weak. What's the reasons for this lack of implementation? And what's, what is stopping us from simply implementing already enacted measures? Um, so I, I'm going to, to address your question, Kevin. However, um, uh, before going to that, I would like to highlight that um, as my colleagues were, were, were discussing, we need to start seeing the bigger picture. I recall the first meeting with the assessors of Manival when they were when they came over to Malta, the introductory meeting, one of their main concerns was, listen, you have issues um, in, in supervising, for example, the financial sector and the gaming sector. So how are you going to ensure that you're going to manage now the um, virtual, virtual financial assets, for example? So I think before entering into new new areas, new business areas, we need to ensure as a jurisdiction um, uh, not to be the first um, um, crypto island or I don't know uh, other titles that we, we, we've got, but we need to ensure that we have the proper systems in place. Um, uh, and that means that it's not only about the FIO and the MFSA, but also about the police that they have the expertise. So in case something crops up, they have the ability to deal with, with such cases, um, uh, the, the, the law courts, yes. uh, etc. So I think that's, that's very important. And I think um, what, what brought us here is um, uh, that we did not have enough, enough human resources and uh, we did not have enough, enough expertise and, and experience. Um, um, we, we, we have entered new, new business areas um, without having the, the necessary structures um, uh, in, in, in the different authorities and different stakeholders. So uh, I think it's, 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 it's very important that all stakeholders, in, 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 including um, subject persons themselves, um, the FIU, the MFSA, from a regulatory perspective, 
um, the, the FIU from an intelligence perspective and also the, the security services, for example, the police and all the stakeholders are prepared for, for, the, different, for the different challenges that will arise um, uh, from the different niches, the sectors that we, we're, we're going in. For sure, for sure, we need the resources at adequate levels to before we move into new areas. For that's sure, but 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 answer what I asked you earlier. Why? What has stopped, in your view, the implementation of already enacted measures? Why? Why am don't? Why isn't action taken where it's obvious that it needs to be? Um. I, I think it's it's something that it's 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 long term. So uh, uh, in the in the past, some of some of the money recommendations were were already being highlighted in 2012, not from an effectiveness point of view, however, from a um, from a technical point of view, um, we 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 always have the mentality to. Um, to deal with such reviews, you know, we, we, we had findings in 2012 when Manival carried out its assessment. We tried to address those, those findings um, by, by making some slight changes, minor changes here and there. However, then when we went for, for effectiveness, um, we, we didn't have the numbers. So practically, okay, we have, we have regulations in place and I think we, we fully fulfilled um, that expect. However, then when, when we were asked to provide numbers, to, to provide um, uh, actual, actual uh, actions taken, the, the, the numbers were, were, were not showing effectiveness at all. Um, uh, and and, and that, that, I think that, 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 that's the main, the main issue that we, that we have. So, and I don't think that it was something that, that it was, um, for example, the FIU had a lot of, of criticism that we, we were not in, um, independent, impartial. And, uh, and if, you, if you see the Manival report, for example, um, it clearly states by the Manival assessors that, that the FIU officers, um, it's, it's on page 38, for example, the FIU officers perform their functions freely and objectively without any undue influence. So I think it's not, it's not an issue that, that the authorities had any, um, um, you know, guidance or, or influence from, from above, but, but um, I, I think they did not have the necessary resources. Um, sometimes we lack, we lack the expertise. Um, um, you know, and and we were we were not as authorities. We were not competitive to to have the necessary controls in place. Um, because if you take, for example, and I I can speak on behalf of the FIU. Um, uh, if we can, we take some statistics, for example, in terms of uh, human resources and investment. Um, if we compare the investment, if we compare the human resources, for example, in 2013. The FIU had only 15 officers. Um, today um, we are 92, so there was a, a huge investment. Even if we compare 2020 with 2018, in 2018 we were 43. So, so we 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 needed. We it it, it was actually need, we, we had we had we were in in dear need of of human resources and exper expertise, and also in terms of budgets. If we if we go for budgets, for example, uh, the the FIU budgets increased drastically. If in 2017 when I joined in, we had 1.2 million budget. Um, last year, um, practically the FIU had almost 9 million, 10 million in budget. So, uh, so uh, we invested in IT systems. We invested in. But, in, but, in but I'm going to bring you back, if I may, because because this is triggered off by a by a by a by a comment which just came through. Which I think you've all seen because it's because it's public. He said, "This um, person says, can we stop beating around the bush?" Um, 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 and and um, um, when the Panama Papers came out in in uh, 2016, I think it was, and no action was taken. That was when FATF got involved, and we and we were caught with our pants down. What are your thoughts on that? Um, from an FIU perspective, I, 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 can, I can speak on behalf of the FIU. I think. Um, at, the, at the FIU, we have always tried to do our best 
um, uh, to deal to deal with 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 all kinds of of of, uh, of of issues. If we're speaking about the Panama Papers, um, we we have taken action. As you know, there there was um, there were leaks, there were media reports that we have taken action. We have passed on the reports to the police. Um, uh, if we, we were not perfect, and I I I, I should admit that, um, uh, if we compare the the, the, the work that is being carried out today with the work that we, we used to conduct in 2017 when I was here. So I don't um, blame, blame, blame my predecessors. Um, I think th there was a huge, huge leap forward in terms of quality, in terms of effectiveness. Um, we learned a lot. We, we, we improved our, our systems, our procedures, our policies. Um, uh, we, 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 we made a huge improvement. Um, uh, in terms, and, and, and we should have all admit that, yes, um, uh, since, since no action was taken in terms of prosecutions, and it's not only on, on Panama Papers, but also on, on other cases, um, I, I think it was an area that was clearly highlighted that we were lacking being a fin um, an international financial center and having one one case of of money money laundering being prosecuted it's it's not acceptable for for manival and the fatf and i think um we all agree uh, that in that area we we need to um we need to improve but not solely in terms of prosecutions but also in in terms of convictions and in terms of of asset recovery um uh, so these are the main three areas that 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 manival uh, sorry that the fatf is is awaiting a um, uh, huge improvement from Malta and also from a supervisory perspective um, in terms of IO3. I think um, IO3, 6, 7 and 8, which deal with supervision, which deal with, with investigations, um, prosecutions, convictions and, and uh, recovery of, uh, of, of assets, um, we, we, we need to improve drastically in order to um, avoid, avoid the grey listing. So, so uh, based on this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring in a tax angle, if I may, Kenneth, and then I'll open it up. There's a view yeah. that, uh, that the tax compliance in Malta, in general, is not up to the standards found in other U European countries. This leads to an, an unlevel playing field between those who pay their taxes and those who don't. Um, 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 do you agree that this is the case? And on, that ba on the basis that tax evasion is one of the one of the money laundering um, um, money laundering offences. Do you think that we can expect to see over the next few months a load of tax driven poor cases with a money laundering angle? So the, the main concern of, of Moneyval in, in, in the report on tax evasion was that um, practically all tax evasion cases here in Malta were being dealt with administratively, whilst in other jurisdictions like, uh, let's say, Italy, for example, um, uh, people, people were being convicted. Um, and we didn't have any cases um, of tax evasion cases, even if, if, if cases were, were um, uh, huge cases, because there's mater materiality also involved. Um, uh, no no, no uh, investigations and, and prosecutions were being, were being uh, made in terms of tax evasion, because practically all tax evasion cases were being dealt with administratively. Um, from an FIO perspective, I can provide some, uh, some uh, um, insight. Um, we, we have sent a number of reports, analytical reports to the police dealing with tax evasion. And uh, since, since uh, um, we have introduced also a new, a new procedure at the FIU, whereby if we receive an SDR, which deals with tax evasion, um, uh, we have introduced a materiality, so there's, there are thresholds involved, and we're channeling reports of uh, low materiality to the CFR, so administrative action can be taken there, whilst for um, amounts which, which amount to, to um, large sums of money of, of tax being evaded, we're channeling uh, um, reports to the police. For example, in 2018, we submitted only one report to the police um, dealing with 193,000 practically of, of tax being evaded. However, as from 2019 and 20, in 2019 we sent um, four, four, uh, four reports, um, which practically dealt with, with one, almost two million, 
in in uh, tax uh, being evaded. And in 2020, we sent five reports dealing with um, almost 33 million of, of tax being evaded. On the other hand, we, we, we submitted um, a number of reports to the um, Commissioner for Revenue, so action is can be taken there. We, we have sent more than 400 reports to the CFR um, from 2018. Um, uh, from 33 um, tax, tax investigations that were carried out by the CFR, um, uh, 1.2 million um, were, were recovered in, 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 in penalties and taxes. So, uh, so from an FIO perspective, we're trying to um, risk assess the, the cases and if, if, if a case is, is high risk um, because it's, it's, it's involved, it, 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 um, the amounts of tax evaded are, are, um, uh, are material, um, we're, we're sending a report to the police, whilst on the other hand, for, for the petty cases, we're sending them to the CFR so administrative action can be taken. But all, but all, but all initiatives seem to be stopping at a police roadblock. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, because because one never reads about about um, um, prosecutions for tax evasion as a money laundering offence in the in the papers. We, we we had one case lately on on tax evasion um, mm -hmm. uh, that was prosecuted. Um, uh, however, uh, I, I, I'm not here to defend the police. Um, uh, some of the cases at the police um, we send intelligence. Intelligence it's quite. Uh, we receive intelligence. Um, uh, it's, it's quite. We're using efficient, efficient um, uh, channels. Um, even between FIUs, we we cooperate um, very closely. Um, however, when when the police, um, one of the main difficulties that the police are encountering is um, to change the intelligence into evidence, especially when um, other jurisdictions are involved, um, especially some some jurisdictions which are highly highly um, problematic so so some in for some cases um uh, the, the the time element is, is crucial because you send request information is not for is not forthcoming immediately or it takes it takes months to to be received by the police um and that 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 uh, that that element is, is is delaying the process however um the police um, has has invested in in, in, in human resources now. Um, they are investing in systems, um, uh, and hopefully, um, we we start seeing seeing results. On on a separate note, we are also collaborating very closely. Um, uh, the FIU, the Malta Police, the Secret Service, um, the AG office. Um, we we're trying to work more closely, especially on high highly complex cases. So we, we share our knowledge, our experience, and uh, we, we try um, to get results in the short term. Fabio, um, 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 traditionally, your, your, your members, accountants in Malta, have played a role in, in raising the bar when it, when it um, comes to, to tax compliance and the tax evasion. Do you, do you think that is still the case? Um, 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 if you, are your members when they go out and do their accountancy work and they're all filing lots of STRs now? I think even in this area, um, uh, in this area, you'll find that our profession has, has raised the bar and continues to do so. I, I'm sure the number of STRs filed was extremely low if present at all um, in the past. And I think now we're seeing, um, as a profession, we're experiencing an increasing number of STRs. Um, not just in the tax area, but I think in a number of other areas, even specifically AML issues. Um, what, what's, what's, it's always, um, I mean, clearly there's more to be done, Kevin. So, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, it, the, it, the Institute has 3,700 members. I'd like to believe that the majority of them, when they're doing their tax compliance, when they're giving advice to clients in tax in other areas, are doing the right thing and wanting to do the right, the right thing. Clearly, the black economy is a is is a very persistent factor of of uh, that characterizes our 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 marketplace as we know. Um, uh, unfortunately, 
and when and when you talk about legitimacy of our model and and why um, the, the the feeling internationally that our tax compliance is weak, uh, there is nervousness not just with the level of black economy or or and non-compliance or evasion, but there's nervousness even with the legitimacy of our legitimate model, uh, because then. When you have, uh, I repeat, polluters um, using certain mechanisms, uh, clearly they tarnish the, the model per se. I think we've seen a big change uh, in, the, in the last six years. We'll, we'll continue to see a bigger change. But the elephant in the, in the room is clearly, as a jurisdiction, and I'm not trying to um, uh, refer to anything in particular or anyone in particular, especially those on the call, but the elephant in the room is, as a, as a jurisdiction, we've had a number of excellent cases. Um, of misbehavior, excellent cases that have been on the press, that have uh, uh, been in front page of, of newspaper, newspapers on a daily basis, and unfortunately, our reaction as a jurisdiction, as a jurisdiction, let me say that, has been extremely weak. So that is what really, frankly, uh, what really, frankly, continues to 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 uh, is our news. If you, if you if you really ask me, now I'm not trying to say no one did their job or no one, uh, but. As a jurisdiction, generally, we have been extremely weak with certain excellent cases, and that is a damning uh, is a damning starting point, frankly. So, if you ask me, uh, as a profession, what are you doing? We are collaborating a lot with the FIU to identify patterns of uh, behavior where accountants should raise STRs, should pay more attention. We're uh, issuing sector guidance in conjunction with the FIU uh, in this area. But at the end of the day, we'll do all of this. We will, we will continue working hard. As a jurisdiction, we need to address the accident cases because otherwise... Um... Okay. Wayne, Wayne um, um, if Malta does, does get put onto the grey list, um, do you think the impact on the local financial services sector will be as dire as many people think? Or, 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 is, it, or is it simply going to be another... Thing that we're going to learn learn to live with. I mean, as I said earlier, if we get grey listed, we have to um, roll up our sleeves even higher and get on with doing whatever is necessary to pass the test. Um, uh, I believe it will. It's already. Um, I, I don't want to be uh, the 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 the. the, the del Malaugurio, but I mean, it's already um, tough on the industry and also because the banks indirectly have, have uh, helped clean up uh, the uh, bad behavior of certain uh, practitioners. Although now I think it's going a little bit overboard uh, in terms of what's doing because we're, we're applying the exception and making it the rule. But in, in short, um, uh, I don't think we should adopt the Iceland model that they got grey listed and kept on going. I mean, our resources are such that, as we've seen, um, selling sunshine and tourism can get really hit uh, badly. So we have a, um, a first-hand experience that um, whoever used to say we have to go back now to tourism, um, the reality is that uh, we need some form of uh, other diversification. And on top of that, I believe that Whilst presently um, uh, businesses, banks, institutions have reservations um, when they see a Malta-based entity involved in a group structure based on what they read in media and, and reputation damage and, and so forth. Um, if there's a great listing, there is no beating about the bush about it. We have been formally um, reprimanded, and uh, it's it's a record on our conduct, so to put it. And if I may use this method, so it is it is going to be dire. Well, uh, I I I wish it were not, but I think it's uh, it's there, and uh, it's something I wouldn't want to add to uh, the coffer of uh, negatives that we have. I think there should be a consistent positive message out there. And that's why I appealed to the Maltese society as ambassadors that we really need to stop enjoying the damage that we are self-inflicting. Because ultimately, unless we start realizing that this is hitting us, all of us, I mean, we've been to two foreign countries 
and especially if I can use Luxembourg as an example. I mean, when you get into the taxi um, uh, in, 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 in Luxembourg, I mean, the taxi driver does not start criticizing his, his, his country and so forth. They try to sell the, the country. We do not, we, we, we have stopped doing that, or some of us have stopped doing that, and now they go to social media, whatever, and they enjoy criticizing um, uh, on the basis of certain uh, situations, as, as, as uh, Fabio alluded to, that, that the damage is there. And this is creating then an impact on us practitioners in terms of how far can we raise the bar in order to try and um, recalibrate the shortcomings on the flagrant situations that we, we've been seeing. I mean, there, there's a limit then as to how far we can go as practitioners in order to, to recalibrate the situation and score the necessary points. And I mean, on the other hand, I mean, should we keep on putting our eggs in one basket and focusing on the financial services industry driven by tax and so forth? Or should we, as part of that uh, strategy, that we're talking look at a more holistic macro strategy because ultimately this 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 strategy that we and i'm sorry to go back to strategy because if we get gray listed we need a strategy to either live with gray listing or else to move away from gray listing and the strategy has to look at the all the the ramifications of the malta experience now, if it's a physical business or a digital business, if they're coming to Malta, they can't drive through roadworks, cranes, um, if they set up in Malta. They cannot go through a bureaucratic process that first you have to um, get permits from one department. From within the same department, you have to move different departments. The digitization is, no, is, is, is full, full of hiccups. I mean, we really need to get our infrastructural system, and by infrastructural, I do not just mean the road network. The cogs have to be well oiled and functioning properly, because at this point, our value proposition has to be, uh, we can't keep on punching above our weight. We need to really deliver more than what, we, what, what, what our mouth is. It's not just a question of putting our money where our mouth is, but literally we have to score more than what we claim. And I firmly believe, and uh, possibly I'm sounding like a broken record because I've been saying this for ages now, the ESGs and the sustainability um, uh, principles and the 10 principles uh, in the UN compact are, should be our guiding principles because even from an EU perspective, you look at the financial side of the ESGs, you've got the green pack. So any securities that are going to be listed, financing and so forth, is going to have these green credentials. So should we start getting up for a triple bottom approach and come up with green credentials in our, our products? On top of that, there's the G aspect, which is the governance aspect. Let's not fool ourselves. The governance aspect, we're not talking about board of directors only here. We're talking about country governance. Now, what are we doing there? So, so ultimately, I firmly believe that if I were to write an, an electoral manifesto today, I would literally work on those ESGs and not just speak about it, but effectively do something about it. I'll just stop. Nobody's, nobody's going to vote for you anyway. Wayne, so 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 don't bother. Can I can I just just run through very quickly the, the, some of the big questions which we haven't come up, okay? And the, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, some are rude. I'm going to leave them out, but 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 others are not. So so um, there is there is one comment here that our any strategy that we do should also include a reputational rebuild um, 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 component to it. I think that's obvious. Um, it's going to take years to restore our our reputation, in my view. But I agree that we need to act swiftly to um, to to rebuild that. I think part of this money val thing, in my view, comes about because of our, of, of the reputational issues. So, so it's a way of getting us getting us to to conform on other areas, in my mind. There's there is another comment here. Um, 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 what about small practitioners? How are they going to cope with servicing their clients and then have to have to also do all these uh, um, AML and other compliance issues? I mean, that's a, that's also a key key point. Um, 
Um, no, I'm going to leave that one out. I'm leaving that one out as well. Yeah, there, there, there's another point here is about dialogue, how important dialogue is between all players, all the stakeholders. Going back again in, in, in um, history, one of our strengths used to be that we used to have the, the regulators, government, all the stakeholders, practitioners, sitting down, meeting regularly, having dialogue as to how to improve stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether that still takes place or not, but if not, I would really urge that, that to, that to um, um, take place. Uh, Wayne is making sense. There's a, there's a, a comment here, Wayne, process. Um, hey, they, they um, didn't say that about you, Fabio. Um, um, okay, I'm leaving that out. Ah, oh, yeah, what is the MFSA's and FIAU's position? on sale of citizenship, visas, and blockchain. I know we're dead with blockchain. Citizenship and visas, Kenneth and Chris. One of you, which one wants to go first? Mela, um, from my end, I'm not, I mean, I, I can't say I'm an expert in the area and, and um, I can't express a concrete view. However, uh, I think one one important point that needs to come out is that uh, for every new area that that the jurisdiction decides to uh, to develop and to to try and uh, create um, benefits for the economy. So for every new area that that we propose and we launch. We need to, as Kenneth uh, mentioned before, and as, as I also mentioned before, uh, make sure that we've got a proper regulatory framework in place, uh, proper uh, um, supervision in place, and where required, proper enforcement. And that not only the regulator responsible for that particular area is an expert, but all the, all the other um, departments um, government departments that uh, need to interact with that particular area are also experts. Um, going back, uh, I know you, you said blockchain we've already dealt with. However, that's, that's the area that I was responsible for. Um, when we started off the crypto asset project, uh, one of the things that, that we try to do as an institution is not only um, ensure that our staff have the required knowledge, but also try to ensure that other government departments that required knowledge would get access to the training and information on the particular field. So uh, we interacted with the FIU, we interacted with the Asset Recovery Bureau, uh, we interacted with the police. Uh, whenever we, we brought training from uh, foreign experts, we invited these people over to the MFSA to ensure that they also can get um, the required expertise and that they could also interact with these foreign experts and get the benefit of their knowledge. Um, I think I think the same the same approach needs to be applied um, in all areas. Yes, and um, I I, I would like to take this op the opportunity to mention this. Uh, we've been criticised that that uh, we're not. Um, uh, licensing institutions in this field um, at, a, at a pace which the industry expects. However, um, this is a new area. We're taking a prudent approach. Uh, we, we are um, uh, ensuring that proper due diligence is taking place, that we properly understand the business models, um, that, that we uh, try to identify risks in relation to these business models and they, that those risks are properly mitigated. Um, and I think that's, that's the approach we should take in every new field that we enter, that we understand the risks and we make sure that those risks are properly addressed and properly mitigated if we want to safeguard um, our reputation. Okay. Um, I, I, I fully agree with Chris with regards to, to risk assessment. Um, in fact, we have provided also um, guidance to, to subject persons with, with regards to citizenship and 
um, with regards to, to, to the fast sports scheme. Um, uh, furthermore, from an intelligence perspective, we, we, we fully, um, uh, we're fully updated with, with all applications and all information. So um, I, 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 I think um, it's, it's an area, uh, even, even blockchain and, and the VFAs, etc. So um, uh, if we have the proper system, control systems in place, and uh, it's very important that that cooperation, um, um, not only between authorities but also with this, with, with, the, with the respective representative bodies and and and, and, and the the actors themselves. Um, uh, I, I I think we, we we can reduce the risk to to an acceptable level. So um, that's that's my my opinion, and and I think for both areas we're we're trying to do that. I don't, um, um, let me just say that based on my experience and, and I'm based on my my knowledge of all the people people involved, I know that the all the stakeholders, the regulators, you you Kenneth FI, you all the practitioners have a, have a, all the good have goodwill and a, I'm a, I'm a, and a, and um, there is a, there is a willingness to try and come up with with product mortar which is reputable which does good things which 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 moves us forward to the places that I want to go. Do you think that the political class, and I'm just, uh, you, uh, oh, this, uh, this I'm bringing in both uh, nationalists, Labour, whatever all the others are called, all of them into one. Do you think that they, that they share that vision? Fabio, I think um, everyone, uh, um, if I can make, if I can make a, a small intervention on this, a very short one, um, I think everyone um, uh, wants to see Malta grow. Ultimately, what what we're missing uh, in terms of what we had in the past is that in the past there was sort of agreement between the two parties um, uh, in relation to financial services. Um, in recent years, I don't think that that, that agreement of sort of uh, having a common a uh, common ground on on financial services is still there unfortunately i think i don't know what the others uh, how the others see this, this situation um financial services has become in certain situations a political ping pong and i think that has damaged um even more the the, the jurisdiction I, fabio i agree i agree with this thing um, the world the, the is consensus around uh, around how the country should 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 project, project itself in financial services, but in other sectors, that's been that's been that's been lost, and that has uh, has uh, damaged the the sector. Clearly, the politics to answer your question directly, because otherwise you tell me that I've omitted a question. Um, uh, I think the political the, pol the political community needs to mature seriously on both sides. Um, uh, First of all, misbehavior is, should not be tolerated, and I will not go into specific cases, but clearly misbehavior should not be tolerated. But even the perception of uh, misbehaving should not even be tolerated by uh, whatever, whatever. But um, in the context, of, um, in the context of, of financial services, we can't um, endanger the water product, as you call it, by treating financial services as a political football. That is, that is a, a big no-no. This doesn't mean that it, uh, whoever, one side or the other, are, are entitled to misbehave. I think it starts off from uh, politicians maturing and not misbehaving and uh, are being seen to be doing the right thing, not just doing the right thing. But clearly, um, with, with the, the maturity in general of politicians and more than needs to, needs to, um, needs to improve and, and not by a small percentage. But by a big one. Clearly, again, in 90, we go back to 1994. Why were we successful? Why was it, uh, and I'm not trying to refer to Labour or nationalists or whoever was the Prime Minister at the time. Um, clearly, at that point in time, the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the matters that gave rise to our success was having um, maturity, was having a, a bit more maturity and a bit more consensus on what is the right thing for Malta. So that has, has played a very important part. I don't find that nowadays, you know, at least in, in our profession and our sector, we don't find that. Um, of course, um, the, the world is, has changed as well. So expectations are set at a much higher level and that's how it should be. 
but but overall um, all players in the in the in the game have to up their have to up their game for for, for want of a better word. So we spoke we spoke about regulators, spoke about politicians. There seems to be a lot of attention lately on the on the market players themselves, on the licensed entities, on the accountants, on the lawyers. There seems to be a lot of shift on those. Even you attend certain certain meetings nowadays, you say, "Ah, oh, we don't make money, but it's because of the practitioners, it's because of accountants, it's because of lawyers." I think, frankly, all elements in the chain have to work from A to Z. So it's it's not good enough saying, "Okay, um, the first element in the chain didn't work, or the last one." Everyone has to up their game. Everyone, every element. Uh, so, so it's useless now going to, and I'm not going to be specific on purpose. Useless going to certain important high profile media saying, okay, if we fail the manual thing, it's because of accounting and others. It's clearly not on. It is. So, okay. Fabio, you will be pleased to know that I've just got two little comments saying Fabio is now speaking sense. Yeah, which, now? Which, and and I'm, now. Not, I'm just quoting, okay? I'm not a, listen, uh, listen, I need to try and bring this to a close. Before I do, though, can I just go around and give me a yes or no answer to this? Kenneth, I'm going to start with you. Okay, um, um, based, on, based on things as they stand today, do you believe we are going to get through Moneyval without getting put on the grey list? Yes or no? From an FIO perspective, yes. So, uh, that was good. Okay, Wayne? Wayne? Let, let me, uh, oh, can you repeat the question so that uh, we'll make sure that you articulate it the same way, just in case? And, uh, let, me, let me just apologize to all the participants. I mean, the, the level of people we get on our panel is not up to our usual standard oh, today. I, I can't, I can't. Okay, I'm joking. Uh, the, well, what, uh, what the question was, Wayne, as things stand today, do you believe that we are going to get through the money val evaluation without getting put on the grey list? I hope so. I, f I, I have fear, though. Fabio? Um, on a technical level, in the area of confiscations and prosecutions, we haven't done enough. Hopefully, on a political level and on a long-term plan basis, we have convinced, or we are in the process of convincing the powers that be, that we, are, uh, that we have a, a plan which goes beyond the number of confiscations in, in 12 months, hopefully. That's, that's my answer. Chris? From a financial supervision point of view, yes. Uh, okay. But that wasn't the question. Uh, well, we need I to work haven't. harder. No. Let me just, just, to add, just to add something, and Kevin, if you allow me. Um, I think as, as of today, um, even from an FIO perspective, we're, we're not fully there yet. So uh, I, I think we should use the, then, the next few months that is um, October to February next year, very carefully um, uh, and very diligently. So uh, I, I think we have uh, four, four or five months um, that we need to work hard, all authorities, including the sectors, so we deliver what is, what is necessary. So um, we, 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 at least even if we go into the gray list, we will, we will, we will have the minimum number of recommendations pending because then if we go into the gray list it depends fully on us um, uh, when to go out of, of the gray list because we need to take all the boxes so um, the more we uh, manage to achieve in the coming in the coming five months um, uh, the more it's, the, 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 it, it, it's crucial yes let me just uh, just say say thank you to all four of you for for uh, taking part in this i I, I, I'm, I'm, I found it really interesting and I hope everybody listening did as well. I know that all four of you really try hard and um, do a great job and I, do, I wish you every, every success in, um, 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 in all your efforts. I mean, because frankly, at the end of the day, your success is also ours. So, uh, so um, um, I wish you all the very best in everything you do.